Ori from the Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill team. Take it away. Yes, um, I'm so happy to be here and uh, see so many people show up uh, to find out about the, the CE bill. Um, I hope that uh, some of you might know something about it, but um, I think I'm, I'm gonna do a sh just a short, uh, pretty high level presentation of, of the bill, its aims, its core principles, and the campaign that we're currently uh, in, in the midst of for the, for the bill. Um, I'm part of the uh, Bill Alliance team, been working on the bill for the last year and a half or so. Um, I'm primarily working with organizations, MBO, uh, NGOs, um, professional organizations, companies to try to get them to come and join the, the Alliance. And there's a group working very much on the political arm, MP lobbying, and a group working on grassroots outreach. Um, you might know that Caroline Lucas introduced this bill early in September uh, with uh, 11 supporting MPs, and it is a private member's bill. I'll say something about that a little later. We now have uh, almost 100 MPs supporting. We, we're getting uh, a few every week. So we're, we're close to the 100 mark, uh, cross party, all parties except um, the Tories to date, but we're sure that a couple of them will, will join as, us as well. But clearly we need a lot more support, which is going to need uh, huge mobilization, grassroots organizations, business, everything. So that's why I'm very happy to see you, so many of you here tonight. The bill is a joined up approach to the climate and ecological emergency. It's basically on, the only bill around that we're aware of that actually you know, acknowledges this fact that we cannot address the, the climate emergency without um, including the ecological health of, of the earth. The bill objective is to require the government legislation to have a strategy as to how it will meet its commitments that it made under the UN Paris Agreement of 2015. To do its fair share in keeping global temperature increase to maximum 1.5 degrees. That's the target. And we, we believe and legally they've signed up to, that's what they're committed to, but we have no strategy. And the bill specifies that as, as an obligation of the Secretary of State to come up with such a strategy. Why now? I think you're all here, so you're all very conscious of, uh, you know, it is an emergency. Five years has gone by since 2015. The UK government declared a climate emergency in May 2019, but, you know, we've seen little to no actual um, action. We're now on a trajectory of three to four degree temperature increases. And that is assuming that the UK meets its 250 net zero target, which truthfully, it has um, currently little, little chance of meeting. The government's own climate change committee reported last July for a fourth year running that the UK is materially underperforming its own milestones on this 2050 plan, meeting only two of 30, 31 milestones 
14 of which have not shown any progress at all. The MOD, Ministry of Defense, also announced that it is planning for food and resource security plans, assuming a 3.5 degree temperature increase. So, and they're assuming that if the UK, even if it does meet its 2050 target, we're looking at temperature increases well above the 1.5 target. The UK is hosting COP next fall. Um, and that we're getting down to a crunch point in terms of opportunity to ha have any global co cooperation which is necessary to address the climate emergency. COP really has to make some progress. And the UK as co-host could actually show some leadership in terms of how, how we could advance talking sensibly about the, the emergency, which to date also has been many words, but little action. The bill provides a ro robust scientific framework based including three core elements. It doesn't provide, you know, proposed solutions or do this or do that or, you know, ban this. The scientist to come up with a strategy, you have to deal with facts and reality. And the three key elements are that the UK has to take full responsibility for its its total carbon footprint. And that includes the carbon emissions related to what we consume that we've imported, as well as transport and aviation. The current UK planet does not include our consumed consumptions. We're basically assuming that, you know, China, India, Bangladesh, where those, which is not fair not nor feasible. The bill also, as I mentioned, recognizes the independence of the environment and biodiversity. And so that is also included in the bill. And related to that is we have to take responsibility, the UK is, has to take responsibility for our supply chains, both domestically and internationally. So in addition to the, the establishment of, of targets under the strategy and the urgency and the scientific framework, accountability and fairness are also embedded in the bill. It's clear that transitioning away from fossil fuels is going to require major changes in our economy and how, how we live. As such, ordinary citizens should have a voice or a say in terms of you know, how, how this is to be done and that it's fair. So the bill includes a representative citizens assembly that will work with government and parliament and scientists to, cre to create this emergency strategy. The assembly is a forum or platform to assess the facts and options outside of ideological and party political platforms. And in that they can come up with, with recommendations or ideas and can basically assist our politicians and MPs 
in making making the final decision. It works within our existing system. It doesn't change parliamentary sovereignty nor our unwritten constitution, but it does provide our MPs who are in a very, um, you know, short term election concerned environment with the basis to make hard decisions and, and involve, involve the population and citizens. This isn't the changes that we have to make. We need the whole country to be online or pulling on the same in the same direction. You know, it does it will not work if 50% of the country, you know, doesn't agree with it. And that's why the inclusion of the citizens assembly is so important. Over the past year, numerous polls have been undertaken actually globally, as well as the UK, which confirmed that over two thirds of the public, you know, acknowledge that, you know, we have a climate emergency and they want, you know, some serious action taken. Of course, they don't know exactly what action However, this bill provides an opportunity to mobilize cross society for a way forward. The Bill Alliance is is building is trying trying to build a cross you know cross social alliance, grassroots NGOs. Greenpeace UK has joined. Uh, Plan B, business declares various businesses, um, but we have to get many, many more. We're, we're hopefully, you know, hoping that uh, organizations such as Friends of the Earth, uh, or RSPB, um, will join us as as they all did for the Climate Change Act of 2018. That was another example where broad social pressure and lobbying resulted in a private member's bill actually making it to legislation. That campaign took three years. We don't have three years. So we have to accelerate that but it has been done in the past for other laws as well, but the Climate Change Act is the most recent one. So that's, that's why you know, we really are doing everything we can to push this forward. Also, various regional alliances are forming. Um, Local council councils um, have come out in support of the bill and are formally requesting their respective MPs to support the bill. Uh, Oxford City and Oxfordshire have recently uh, done this. Forest of Dean and there are about four or five others where cross party you know, councillors have come together and you know, officially supporting the bill and requesting the area's MP to support it as well. And I've just, you know, uh, Bristol is, I know one of the over 200 principal councils throughout the UK that has a net zero target of 2030, well before the national 2050. It is going to be, I would say, impossible, if not virtually impossible, for Bristol to reach that target without substantial national financial and legislative support to make that happen. 
So the local, local councils and regions should be banging at Westminster's door to progress, th progress this. To succeed, we'll get, we need radical cooperation. That means that we can't be fighting for this or that policy, this or that, uh, you know, um, piecemeal approach or piecemeal solution that won't work. And the bill allows parties to step back, take a look at the big picture and figure out how we are going to find the path forward. What you can do, clearly lobby your MP, and that's directly as a constituent, and that's indirectly through your count, council levels, through other organizations. Spread, spread the word about the bill and promote the bill, you know, throughout the, your neighborhood, work, colleagues, because everybody is going to be impacted. And in which also we, uh, you know, are operating on a shoestring. You know, if you can afford to donate at all, that would also be greatly appreciated and is needed. The Alliance has um, a lot of resource material and help in terms of um, assisting in your lobby efforts or understanding the bill or communicating. I hope that if you haven't already joined the campaign, you will, after this meeting, go to our website, which is CE Bill, you type it in, it pops up. Uh, there, there's a brief explanation of the bill, the bill text, which is quite short. Actually, I think it's only about eight or 10 pages. Um, if, it, if you join the campaign, you can join as an individual or as an organization. I hope that Clifton Climate Action will, jo will join as an organization because again, you know, the bigger we, you know, can grow the movement, the better chance we'll have. Um, there are also other organizations that can assist. There's um, Hope for the Future, which is a, a charity which provides information as to how, how to lobby your MP. They they will provide briefs on your MPs in terms of voting records, history, uh, also tips on how to how to approach and engage with your MPs. And actually, Hope for the Future also is providing a um, uh, a, res a resource pack about the bill specifically, which you might find useful. The Alliance campaign also has um, um, the grassroots support. Um, if you join the campaign, we have bi-weekly newsletters that come out. Uh, grassroots team is running an open sessions once a week where campaigners can call, call in and you know, uh, discuss their experiences or ideas. So there is quite a bit of support on that side. Uh, one item I'd like to address, and that's the fact that this bill is a private member's bill. As I said, Caroline introduced it as such. 
And it's true that most private members bills do not make it into legislation. However, they can influence, you know, legislation by bringing up topics and issues and impacting other policy decisions. The private members bills have also, they have made it into legislation. As I mentioned, the Climate Change Act of 2008, you know, terminated from a private member's bill. So we know it can be done. We just have to have the will and the public has to demand it. Um, on the Alliance website, there's also, um, information about, you know, response to uh, critique or issues that MPs frequently bring up regarding the bill. So that can, that can aid you in, in engaging with your MP. But MPs themselves say, you know, we, if constituents, constituents are, you know, don't keep banging on, they do, they do hear them and they realize that they have to do something. And even, you know, to get the Climate Change Act originally when it was proposed, it had no conservative support. But when it came to the voting on the bill, all but I believe five or seven conservatives supported the bill. So if they see that their constituents, you know, cross party want something, they will respond. And I, I personally think that the MPs cannot help to realize that they themselves do not know what to do. They don't know the answer. And this bill basically provides a possibility of getting toward the answer that the country wants. Um, the C Bill Alliance also has Twitter, Twitter and is on social media. I will admit I'm not because I'm not there. It's another generation. Um, and there are YouTube um, videos of various events, including a very interesting one with um, uh, scientists and Rosie Boycott from the beginning of November that are on our site. Business Declares ran a very um, popular event last week with over 100 business people calling in dis discussing the bill. So those you have some time and are interested, they might be helpful as well. And before we get to, you know, discussion and questions, which I think that's, um, you know, the most important part, I'd like to leave you with one quote. Nothing, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. The bill is a chance for us to face the facts, acknowledge what we have to do, and provides a process to determine how it is done. And with that, I would like to open it up. I also, oh, what I forgot to mention is I believe, and Darcy, I hope is still on the call. I believe that uh, Bristol has a CE Alliance bill um, forms and has a Facebook uh, account and group. So I hope to hear that, you know, Bristol Council is is going to join. Yeah, so I've just been messaging with 
Darcy, if Darcy would like to uh, unmute, um, you've got a minute or two or however you, however long you want really to uh, sell us all on joining the Bristol CEE Bill Alliance. Oh uh, yeah, I'm really pleased to be here and great to hear, um, hear you again, Laurie. Thank you for that. Yeah, so there, um, there's quite a lot of people in, in Bristol who have been campaigning on the CEE Bill and we have um, uh, very recently, in the last few days, um, organised ourselves into C Bill Alliance Bristol to um, give ourselves a bit of an identity and make it easier for us to support each other, people who want to campaign and support the C Bill Alliance. Um, I don't want to repeat anything that Laurie said, but it's really difficult to overstate how uh, desperately late it is to be taking action. Um, we're at 1.3 degrees of warming now since pre-industrial levels and scientists have repeatedly told us we mustn't go above, 1 point, uh, above 1.5. And that's what's so fantastic about the CE bill is the 1.5 degree threshold is at the, the heart of the CE bill. So uh, when people say that we need action and governments say, yes, we spent X million pounds on this or X million pounds on that. So everything's okay. Actually, we're in pretty dire straits and it doesn't matter how many, you know, X million pounds they spend. The issue is, are we going to go above 1 point above 1.5 degrees of global warming in the next few years or not? Um, and um, the bill was launched in September. Uh, and since then, it's, uh, it's attracted the support of, uh, when I looked yesterday, 95 MPs, which is fantastic. So, you know, this has seriously got legs. And if we, if we choose to pull together, you know, we really can make a difference. We've got four Bristol MPs and there are uh, people in constituencies around Bristol that we'd like to support as well. But there are four Bristol MPs. Uh, Darren Jones of Bristol North has stepped up and... Um, publicly said that he supports the bill. We've got three other Labour MPs in Bristol who are proving to be a very tough proposition. And what it really comes down to is it's a numbers game. Uh, how many constituents are prepared to mobilise and tell their MPs that they want this, they want their MPs to support this, and how many of their friends and families and neighbours uh, and colleagues can they bring along? And that's really where that's really where C Bill Alliance Bristol started, is from people, first of all, mobilising their friends and then uh, flyering their neighbours. And it went from a few people flyering their neighbours to the point where we've now flyed about um, 75,000 homes in Bristol to, um, to tell them about the C Bill. So if you want um, to wrap up, uh, if you want to um, get in touch on Facebook, please... Um, find uh, C Bill Alliance Bristol, like us and follow us. There's also uh, an email address, which is ceebill.bristol at gmail.com. And if anyone wants to chat, just get in touch um, through the Facebook page or the, um, or the uh, email address and we can chat. Um, but then some very practical, um, practical tools on the Facebook page. Um, many of them actually linking back to some of the great resources that Laurie was talking about on the, on the um, Alliance's website. But um, uh, I think at this stage, lobbying our MPs is key and there's a lot of guidance that we can give each other and support you can find about that. And then how many people can you bring with you? If you lobby your MP, that's brilliant. But if you uh, and your partner and your friend and some of your neighbors lobby the MP as well, then we're, then we're really going somewhere. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that covers it. It'd be really great if people want to get in touch because you know, together, together we can really take this somewhere and we can build on those 95 MPs that we've already got. Absolutely, yeah. No, thank you very much for that, Darcy. If you want to stick around, um, <clears throat> you may have something you want to add uh, when we come to some of these questions that we're going to be uh, talking about. Um, but yeah, no, uh, thank you, Laurie, very much for that presentation. Um, really, really appreciate you being here. Uh, we've got some good questions. I, if I may, I'm, I'm going to exact some uh, host privileges. And uh, somebody else did ask this question as well. I'm just going to do it slightly out of order. 
But I think the thing I found the most interesting thing about what you were saying is that the bill, uh, it would mandate that the government come up with a plan to stay below 1.5, but it doesn't propose any specific, uh, you know, measures to achieve that. It just says you must come up with a plan and sort of leaves it to the government. And sort of, I guess, I guess, first of all, the question is why was I, know, I, I, I don't think either of you were involved in actually writing the bill. If you were, I'm sorry. Um, but why do you think that decision was made the way that it was? Because the, 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 they have to come up with a strategy, but it isn't the government working in isolation. That's why the Citizens Assembly is so important okay because that's and it takes it takes the discussion out of the existing uh parliament party environment where it's the you know it's the green new deal green or it's boris's labor uh boris's tory it's it's getting we guys we have to get the facts, the truth first, and then we can decide how to do it. Okay. Yeah. And, no, by, I, I... and, and by going in at it reverse, I mean, I don't think, you know, I don't think most people realize how big of a challenge and big of a change is required. I don't think most MPs do either. Um, and you have to accept accept that first and then decide, okay, how do how do we go forward? And basically it's it's gonna come to trade-offs and what's more important. And that's why it's it's critical to have ordinary people in the room, you know, um, teachers, taxi drivers, office workers, farmers, and not just, you know, a group of MPs or civil servants who make up, you know, a, a very um, tiny portion of the country and society. <coughs> um, so that's 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 why. And if you start with with this policy or that policy, you end up arguing until the cows come home. This, you know before you ever get to the bill. Mm. And so that's that's why it was purposely drafted this way because um, we don't, so it, there's no silver bullet. Nobody has the answer. Even the main scientists can't tell you with 100%. It's going to come down to, you know, informed judgment based as, on much science as you have. And then, making some moral and ethical decisions as well. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So that's, that was as, the as, thinking behind it. As Matthew points out in the chat, he just says, how we go about this is an enormously complex job. The government has access to the experts. So I, I get that. And, um, but also, no, I, I do understand. It's just, I'm, Honestly, I hadn't looked into the bill in too much detail because I knew we had this talk and I wanted to come in with a with a, a fairly open mind. But one of the things that excited me about it was how many climate experts and ecology experts had been involved in drafting it. And so I just I assumed that there would be uh, more robust uh, recommendations in there. But I completely understand the rationale behind it that you know, as we saw in America when uh, the first version of the Green New Deal um, was introduced, that just got into a whole squabble about tiny parts of it. And so maybe you just need to pass something. I don't know. It's, uh, yeah. Could, could, I'd like to, experts will be, they, they're, they're critical in this process. And mm. the process includes experts. Mm. But it, it isn't, we, we don't turn it, the decisions over to experts and we say, you go do it. It's because it impacts daily life, everybody's life. They should have the ability to have, 
some say or understanding. And actually, I don't know how many of you um, are aware, but there was a citizens assembly um, run by six select committees last year with 115 um, randomly chosen citizens from all over the country. They met for, I think, six or seven weekends. They had a very narrow brief and they did hear from numerous experts on uh, different elements of, of um, solely carbon really. Um, and they came up with some recommendations that are even more um, you know, far reaching than Boris's 10, 10 point plan. You know, it, you don't have to understand the physics to, to come up with some, you know, common sense um, uh, recommendations. One being is, yeah, they also said we should do a quicker transition to electric vehicles. However, and we should also be stopping our road building we should also we should have more um, strategy for increased localization, so you don't need as much land transport. Um, and by the way, we don't think the government should be uh, depending on unproven technologies to car to capture carbon. They should be concentrating on natural carbon sources, reforestation, um, preservation, and those type of um, steps. Um, so that even with, you know, there, as I said, they had a limited brief, they weren't given the full science, they don't, they didn't, weren't even told what a 2050 net zero means, that it means 50%, you know, chance that will stay within 1.5. Uh, they weren't told that, you know, the, the current UK plan basically is outsourcing a third of our emissions. So, I mean, it was, it had a lot of, you know, shortcomings, but, you know, if it were done uh, more, the process were more robust, you know, we think that's probably the best way to, you know, come up with a, a strategy that could be implemented in a fair and just manner. Scotland is cur currently having a citizens assembly and their question, which is, is much, um, much more legitimate, is how should Co Scotland change in the face of the climate emergency in a fair and effective manner. So the Citizens Assembly has a much broader question. And also just to note, they heard from Kevin Anderson. Kevin Anderson was one of the experts presenting. So I don't know if any of you have listened to Kevin Anderson, but he's pretty you know, hard hitting but he also can convey, you know, complex um, uh, issues in an understandable manner. Um, they, they also heard from uh, Julia Steinberger from Leeds, who is also, you know, questions, um, you know, more the sort of the, the economic and social structure that, you know, probably has to be considered. Um, so it's not that the, the process clearly, you know, experts are, are, you know, vital, but experts should not be making all the decisions because these decisions aren't, they're moral and ethical decisions. Why should a scientist be making those. And in some ways, it's the same for MPs. Why should they be making all our moral and ethical decisions? In some ways, we've been lazy for the last 20 years. We sort of outsourced all our responsibility. Okay. 
Um, we've got lots of questions I want to get to. Uh, first, I'm just going to flash uh, this back up on the screen so that everyone has a reminder of our upcoming talks, our websites, our different projects, and of course, the all important uh, PayPal link if you uh, want to chuck us a few bob. Uh, three, four, five pounds per person would make a huge difference uh, to our organization and all of the wonderful things we're able to do. Um, so I've just lost uh, the chat box. Where did it go? Um, but the question that I, the, the first question that came in while you were speaking, uh, Laurie, was about uh, lobbying your MP. Now you've said obviously there's a lot of information about lobbying your MP on the website. Um, but just briefly, what is it specifically that we're asking our MPs to do at this point? Because it's we there's no timeline for a vote or anything. Are we simply asking, you know, I think most of the people, well, most of the people that these two groups represent live in Bristol West, which is represented by Thangham Debonair of the Labour Party. She has not voiced support for the bill yet. Um, if I were to email her tomorrow, would I simply be saying, voice public support for the bill or is there anything else that I need to ask her to do? Um, that's that's a start and I mean we're asking that the MPs actually to, to sign an early day motion which basically is a request for the government to give time to debate this this bill. Uh, and clearly we're going to need hundreds of MPs you know demanding that before before it's going to happen, um, but that that's a specific ask, you know, officially. And you know, there there's boilerplate, you know, pushback. But again, you know, if we don't, if they're clear, we're not going away. And you know, particularly on the red wall, if even those Tories start to feel like they might have a hard time being reelected if their constituents want this and the Tory party is stonewalling, you know, they also have some some uh, power within, you know, their organizations to say, well, maybe we should be looking at, at this. So yes, the specific ask is, you know, support support the bill or tell us tell us why you don't support it. And I mean um we had, you know, what I think it was a Tory or it might have been Labour. So, oh, well, you know, I don't agree with the 2030 deadline uh, target. And it's sort of like there's not a 2030 target in the bill. There's not even 2050 target in the bill. So what, you know, stop being so lazy. <laughs> or, you know, uh, one is citizens assemblies don't work. We, you know, just let us get on with our with the job. Um, there was a citizens assembly in Canada and it didn't do anything. Well, yeah. There have been 300, you know, uh, processes since then that have actually, you know, made some change. So just, you know, that's, um, you know, an, an unsubstantiated uh, throwback. And there's, there's actually, there's an all parties committee in the House of Co Commons supporting um, increased citizens participation and citizens assemblies. So just sort of turn around and say, no, they're you know, the garbage we don't want it is, you know, um, and it has been used uh, to look at funding of adult social care in the UK. And that it actually came up with some good recommendations. Parliament then totally ignored the recommendations, but I mean, it, it could have been uh, used. And that's where citizens have to hold the MPs and government's foot to the fire. You know, if we if we if they pass the bill, we also have to ensure that the process is, you know, is is legitimate and open and fair, and it has to be clear from the beginning, you know, how they plan to to work with the assemblies. It's not just a it isn't just a PR vehicle. Yeah. Uh, Laurie, um, Dorian, could I could I just say something about um, writing to your MP? Sure. Um, which, which is there's, um, please, there's, some, yes, there's some really good uh, guidance on the CE Bill Alliance website. Um, there's a page, you know, write to your MP, which has got excellent guidance. 
and it's it's signposted on the front page of our Facebook page, Seabill uh, Alliance Bristol. Um, and um, my experience of writing to Thangham Debonair, who's my constituency MP, is um, I sort of poured my heart into my first uh, email to her. You know, it was really long, and she she does respond with, as Laurie said, you know, a, a sort of she didn't even use my name when she wrote back. You know, a sort of uh, template a template letter, very very long, uh, saying she takes the issue incredibly seriously, but she's not going to do anything. Um, and it's at that point uh, that you just want to hit reply and uh, hit reply and say, can you just explain that contradiction? And, and that's, that's a very practical way that we can all do what Laurie's talking about, which is holding the MPs uh, feet to the fire and, and asking to, to make good on what they're saying. Uh, and the last thing I'd say about that is if you, if you do get in touch with the um, Seville Alliance Bristol, then if you have any questions when your MP comes back to you, then um, we can help each other with that because we've got a lot of people who have been around the block a few times on this now. And so if your MP is saying something, a reason why they're suggesting it's not worth doing anything on this, um, you can find out what the actual context is for that. And maybe, maybe there's something the MP needs to consider that you can then put back to them. But fundamentally, it is a numbers game. The more, the more of us do this, the more inevitable it is that um, our MPs will step up and do the right thing. That was all I wanted to say. Yeah, that's great. Um, just, just quickly, Darcy, before you um, log off completely, um, someone was asking about where Bristol Council, whether there's been any movement within Bristol Council to pressure our MPs or anything like that. Um, I assume you're also working on them. Uh, yeah, that's a really good. That's a really good question. That's um, uh, a great initiative that's come out of the Sea Bill Alliance is for councils to pass resolutions supporting the CE bill and committing themselves to lobby lobby local MPs. And I think that's definitely something we wanna carry forward in Bristol. Um, so that, that's one of the next steps that we're looking at. We've got council, council elections on the 6th of May. And so what I'm hoping that we can do between now and then is make that, a, um, make that one of the key election questions for people who are standing for council in Bristol, yeah. where, do, where do you stand on the CE bill? Definitely, yeah, great. Um, I'm gonna omit the questions that are about donations and things, uh, PayPal, monthly donations and things like that. Um, take that up with the website. I think we're here to discuss the, the bill itself. I hope that's okay. Uh, hopefully you're able to get the answers you want. Um, Nicola asked about how, what, what can we ask universities to do? Uh, can universities sign up in the same way that an organization like Clifton Climate Action or the BCR Energy Group would? Um, yes, I believe they can sign up as an organization. And we do have a, a pretty active student network. We're also getting kicked off the ground. Um, Birmingham is, is running a big uh, Green Week next week. And we're talking both about citizens assemblies and the bill. Uh, the UK Youth Climate Coalition is a, a supporter. So yeah, the, clearly it's, you know, the, the whole climate movement is running off the back of, of the student strike. And we want to um, encourage, you know, university and students to, to get involved. It's, it's their future. And you know, the world that we're lead, lead, leaving them. And uh, just to, to underpin Darcy's comment, uh, the, the council action is, I think, really powerful because I mean, you get to a point the MP is going to, after your third letter, is going to basically ignore you. But if he, you know, they start getting pressure from the council level from underneath as well. So again, hitting them you know, as broadly and from as many sides is, is how we have to, you know, manage this campaign. Um, uh, there was a question here about uh, timing. The bill is a private member's bill. It did have a second reading scheduled for March. Uh, because of COVID, they have um, suspended Friday sittings, which was usually when such bills were read. Um, but 
it was a, it's an unexpected, it's not expected that it would get a second reading at this point in time because there aren't enough MPs, you know, demanding it. But, you know, if we get another 100, 100 MPs supporting it, an early day motion, you know, and the more, um, you know, discussion and noise around it, you know, the, the more that, you know, we have have the possibility of, of getting a real discussion. Just to let you know, I mean, the, the agricultural bill and the environmental bill have some amendments going through and the Alliance has, has supported some of those amendments that sort of are in line with the climate and ecological bill, but none of those amendments or, or laws come anywhere near to addressing the problem. And in the sixth budget, the sixth budget, it again, it doesn't, it doesn't acknowledge and deal with the broader ecological uh, element of the emergency, nor does it acknowledge, you know, the whole supply chain issue. So that's why the bill really is unique in that manner. And you know, it gets away from this piecemeal. We will never get there piecemeal. So that's why the other, you know, really, um, I would say, major uh, benefit of the bill is that it, you know, it takes a holistic approach. Yeah, definitely. Um, just a quick one. Do you know if there's a separate bill in either Wales or Scotland, or is this fully focused on Westminster? Um, well, you know, they both Wales and Scotland do, you know, have some devolved powers. Um, and as I said, this the in Scotland is running its own climate assembly for the 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 uh, Scottish. Uh, Scottish policies, which I think all except electricity, potentially or energy, are are devolved. Wales is not quite as devolved, but in Wales is also um, the Welsh colleagues are are campaigning for the bill, but they're they're starting. They have national elections, and what they've done. Is they've formed alliance a six an alliance based on six principles, which are essentially the principles of the bill, and they're using that as um, uh, for the 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 May elections to basically get you know cross party all all politicians supporting these principles, which then we hope then could roll up to you know, if you support those principles, then well, Wales should support be be uh, you know pressuring its Westminster MPs to support it as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we've got uh, a woman in the chat with her hand raised on Zoom. Uh, I I've sent you a message to ask if you had a question you wanted to answer, but you didn't reply. Um, did you did you want to say something, Susan? Oh, uh, hi, Doreen, and thanks to everyone for this discussion. It's really interesting. Um, I, I guess rather than sort of ask the question in the chat, if it's OK to just ask it sort of in person, um, you know, obviously I support everything that you're doing. Um, I guess, you know, the title of the bill covers such a huge range of topics. Um, you know, the climate emergency on the one hand and the ecological emergency on the other hand. And I guess, you know, I'm slightly concerned that there are issues that pull in different directions under that banner. Um, a good example is the HS2 project. Um, on the one hand, the government says HS2 will save carbon by moving um, traffic and, and, and freight off roads onto rail. Um, but meanwhile, they are busy cutting down ancient woodland across the country and they proposed to take out uh, Euston Square Gardens in, in London, Euston as the terminus. And they evicted us this morning um, from Euston Square Gardens. So th the concern I have, I suppose, with the bill is um, 
obviously, you know, everything that you're suggesting is, is fantastic. Um, but how can we as citizens exercise our rights um, to protest against something that on the face of it looks like a good response to the climate emergency, but actually in its um, construction um, will actually undermine that quite significantly. Um, and, and, you know, we, as citizens, it's been proven um, just through that one example, um, because that, that HS2 are relying on powers that they were given in 2017 to take ownership of land in this way. How can we convince anyone, whether it's the councils or our national governments, that, you know, we have a legitimate right to protest and to, to exercise our, our rights to oppose these so-called um, uh, proposals that, that are supposed to improve uh, the climate uh, situation and in, in that sort of trajectory towards net zero by 2050. Um, you know, it, it just feels to me like obviously citizens assemblies, but councils at the moment are beholden to governments because their funding is cut and then they rely on that sort of private sector um, investment to fill their coffers and, and they're allowing those land grabs in many respects. So, you know, my concern I suppose is that we obviously have a problem with central government, but we also have a problem with local government just because of the broken model of society that we have, which is predicated on turning a profit out of taxation. Um, and so all the while we've got that model in operation in the UK, it feels just so difficult to give citizens the power to make change at a local level. Um, and maybe that's just a personal view, but I, I just wonder what, what Laurie does that's think fine. about that. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm struggling. The, your first premise that somehow HS2 was was counter to the bill or whatever. I just I have trouble following that. Um, I you know I think HS2 as from a climate cli you can't disassociate climate with ecology or carbon. They're 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 interdependent. You can't look at one in a box. So you have to look at how one impacts the other. And I think taking HS2 as a whole. Yeah, it's you you can't justify it in terms of, you know, getting to net zero. It goes in the opposite direction. So that's a no-brainer. But I don't think the bill should should not write no HS2 on its banner. Cause I mean, again, you get then it's this, this against that, and you get you end up infighting. So the bill is is the framework. And the issue with with local powers versus national powers, that that's there with or without this bill. And the, the bill, I mean, let's face it, we need national government action. No local council is going to get to 2030 net zero without some major national money and, you know, national strategy. So it's, yes, and I do think more decisions should be made at the local level, exactly how things are done. But that you know, that is, that's a process and you can't, this bill doesn't attempt to, to address that issue, but the strat, in the formulation of the strategy and the fact that you have citizens involved and it's not being done in some back room with, with, you know, the top 5% of the, the population will automatically bring some of these concerns and issues out in the open to be considered. And people, the, the assembly is going to have representatives from people from, from, far, from farming in uh, smaller towns. So they're gonna ask, you know, how, does, how is that gonna impact me? How is that gonna be delivered? And they won't get into the, the specific design, but they can come up with some core principles, which then can be used to formulate de detailed policy or strategy. I, it, it isn't easy. Do I have, do I think it's gonna succeed? 
some, I'm very skeptical many days, but I don't see any better alternative. And if somebody has a better alternative, please. And if, you know, um, so we have to, we have to work with what we have. Okay. And I think the bill is, is the best thing we have. And even if it's not passed into law by COP, if the principles are discussed and put on the table that countries have to be considering their full carbon footprint, that they can't outsource their supply chains, that will make a huge positive impact on the discussion. Yeah, okay, great. Um, I think we're gonna wrap it up there uh, because it has gone half past. And uh, yeah, that was lots of really good questions. Thank you very much, everybody who submitted one. Um, and thank you very, very much to Laurie and Darcy who's had to leave for answering them. Um, I hope you all feel a bit better informed about this bill and everything that it faces uh, to hopefully become law. Um, if you wanna check out any more of the specifics, it's ceebill.uk is the website for all of the other information. Um, and if you want to get involved in the Bristol group that Darcy is, is heading up, uh, they've got a Facebook page, CEE Bristol, I think it was. Um, and the email address for the Bristol group is ceebill. Excuse me, ceebill.bristol at gmail.com. Um, but yes, all of that you can find, I'm sure, with a quick Google or on Facebook. Um, thanks I've again also, to oh, Laurie. I've also put, you know, my email at the alliance is alliance at cebill.uk as well. Okay. I'll just put it in the chat. Okay. Yep. Yeah, great. Anyone in the chat can grab that one. Um, but yes, thank you all very much for coming. We'll be back in two weeks. My lights have just gone out. I don't know what is happening. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, okay, I need to go. I need to go and fix that. Uh, please check out our websites. Check out everything about the CE bill. Please donate to our PayPal. It really, really helps. And uh, we will see you in two weeks for a talk about air pollution. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.